So good morning. Hi, Gaia. It's lovely to see yeah. you. It's been a, um, a long time since we've seen each other in real life. Um, I'm delighted to be here speaking to you on the occasion of your exhibition, online exhibition with um, Richard Saltoon Gallery, Virginity is Not a Contraceptive. Um, so I, I've been familiar with your practice for a long time. The first exhibition I think I saw of yours was um, at Mimosa House, I think in 2018, as part of a group show, um, Supernature in two parts. And in that exhibition, I was introduced to these new works that I think you were making at that time, where you were engraving or carving into these um, sheets of rubber, which were really unusual. Like I'd never seen anything like that at that time. Um, and a lot of the imagery in those works, I think were based on plants, if I remember correctly. Um, and there was also a performance element to that, um, to that presentation. So before we go into the works um, that you're presenting with Richard Saltoon, I thought maybe we could start by just sort of recollecting um, that earlier presentation because it's it's really formative in my mind when I think about your practice um, in that it, it sort of brought together performance, um, image making, these kind of sculptural elements. I think that um, there was a sculptural element where people put something inside their mouth. Yes. Um, and, and it was very ritualistic in my um, recollection, uh, which I think is also a really important part of your practice. So um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about those two bodies of work, both the, um, these drawings on rubber and this amazing performance, um, Mimosa Pudica, um, which was, really about the, the plant mimosa, which is um, understood to be uh, a kind of shy plant, that it, it sort of recoils when, when you touch it, has quite animalistic behaviors sometimes. It moves really quickly in response to um, contact with people. Um, so yeah, maybe you could just start by speaking a little bit about those works. Yes, uh, it's interesting you mentioned these works because um... Uh, the current show at uh, Richard Saltoon is, um, you know, it has a series, uh, um, kind of a contraceptive series, what are they called, Call, uh, which is from 2015. And, um, and then some new works from like the last uh, couple of years. And what happened in between, between this like contraceptive series, which was very much uh, linked to like my personal experience and what, uh, you know, I, I just been like, I just had two kids in two years and I didn't want any more. And I was kind of looking, okay, what's happened to like, how do you actually need to deal with controlling your body for the next 20 years probably? And uh, what are the options? And also how were these options? Like, what did it came to from historically? Um, and uh so from that series to like the new works that have a lot to do with uh, plants and um, in particular psychotropic plants, uh, there is like this moment in which um, I went to Brazil for a residency and this is where I produce all the works in rubber. And um, in a way, um, it sounds very strange to speak about contraceptive and psychotropic plants, but actually historically uh, they were connected. And uh, this connection, you, there is, um, you know, Silvia Federici speaks a lot about it in her work. Uh, and also there was this book uh, um, called La Donna Non Agente, which unfortunately is not in, translated in English by Armanda Guiducci, who also treats about subjects. One of the things which, you know, really stuck in my in my memory was the performance that you made with this plant, um, mimosa. Yes. So, um, as I mentioned, this this plant, you know, is known for being quite shy, um, and it, it it's sort of timid in a way. Whereas the performance that you made, your role in it, I felt was kind of counterpoised to that. It was um, quite defiant, uh, and really was sort of speaking about female sexuality as quite a 
um, a strong or, or powerful um, principle. Um, so you were wearing these metal bracelets, which you were moving with, and they were creating this kind of percussive, rhythmic sound um, in the exhibition. Um, and I, yeah, I found this kind of combination of something which is very sort of um, delicate and sensitive, and then this this other side of of femininity, which is strong and powerful, um, really resonant um, for me. And I think you know there are so many ways that the plant kingdom is associated with with femininity or the the feminine principle um, in terms of sort of nurturance or shelter or you know bringing forth life. Um, into the world. So I think, yeah, it's really interesting now that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about the new work that you're presenting at Richard Saltoon, which, as you say, is very much about um, the reproductive rights of women or the, the reproductive force and potential that we have in our bodies that in different ways have been oppressed through history. Um, the, this sort of wisdom that resides in the body that you know, is a natural force that we have, but that has been treated with suspicion and, uh, and you know, particularly with the dawning of enlightenment principles and uh, the, the sort of dominance of rational thought, um, these more intuitive or lived experiences through the body um, have been treated with suspicion. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, a really nice relationship between that earlier work that you made and these more recent paint, you know, this more recent body of painting. And for me, it's quite hard to speak about a performance, but uh, there are like several elements to it. The first element were some uh, porcelain sculptures that uh, I made individually. And uh, all these sculptures were um, meant to be held in the audience mouth. So each member of the audience, if they wanted, will be given this like little sculpture to hold in their mouth while the performance will happen. Um, so I made uh, two series of works uh, with uh, this principle. Uh, and in the first works, uh, the sculptures were quite big and were maybe this size and they had very like elaborate shape. And uh, I thought the people, uh, it was called Other Ways before series. And I thought people will uh, put it in their mouths and perceive the shape and so on. By showing it, uh, I learned that uh, some people were afraid uh, of accidentally swallowing them. And, uh, and also that uh, really more than being about the shape, uh, it was about being aware that you have something in your mouth that is bothering you. And so the kind of flow of thoughts gets interrupted for a little bit. And the patience of people by to have something in their mouth is maybe 15 minutes and you need to show them something else at the same time. <laughs> so it's not something like an endurance like contest, but uh, because uh, you know, it's like having a blister, you have something that draws your attention to your body and at the same time keeps you quiet. So you're not commenting on what you're seeing. You're not uh, chatting. And, it becomes very, you have this really present group of people uh, which are part of the performance uh, as much as the performer in a way. And uh, I really like this situation uh, in a way, like we are all in it together. But for this series, for a Mimosa Pudica performance, I made this, uh, they are actually, the, um, the sculptures are casts of contraceptive pills. So they're really tiny porcelain things uh, and they're glazed. So it will be very easy to accidentally swallow them. And I also like the fact that uh, the audience, uh, like probably like half of them will know what that pill was uh, and for the other half not. Like basically all women will know what that is. Uh. <laughs> all men is like, oh yes, it may be like some kind of pill but you don't know which one exactly. But because contraceptive pill is really tiny, a bit round, quite specific uh, shape. And so and everybody had it. And then uh, I actually had to sleep train uh, this plant, uh, Mimosa pudica, because Mimosa pudica so is a plant that uh, 
is characterized by quick uh, leaf movement. So the leaf move, leaves move when you touch it. Nobody knows exactly why, maybe is to detract uh, predators, maybe, but uh, I mean, they don't know why, but uh, it does it. And it takes a lot of energy to do it. Uh, for a plant to move, uh, it's really dispendious of uh, its resources. But uh, because it has this characteristic, which is normally an animal characteristic, uh, through history, scientists, uh, biologists have always thought uh, maybe communicates, maybe is intelligent, maybe is, because in, in the end, uh, as humans, uh, we tend to make this mistake of assuming that everything is more intelligent if it does something more similar to us. So plants are more intelligent if they move, uh, or <laughs> if uh, <laughs> something, an animal is more intelligent if it can speak, uh, or like, a, but, well, actually there is a lot of other kinds of intelligence that don't actually work on movement or speech, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, things that look like us. But in any case, I was fascinated by the fact that this plant for this very, you know, it's just like any other plant, but because it moves, uh, then it was called a sensitive plant, shy plant, uh, touch me not, uh, um, all this kind of uh, shame plant, uh, all these kind of uh, adjectives that I think normally describe kind of a very, I don't know, uh, like a very pudrish woman, a bit like victimized almost, like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, like very strange. Um, set of like uh, adjectives and uh, um, I read that uh, the roots of this plant uh, they seem to be uh, a hormonal contraceptive with similar properties of a pill but mm -hmm. they work especially on men there is not extensive research on it but uh, it seems that in Ayurveda has been used in that sense and, so, I mean, I don't know how scientifically sound the whole thing is, uh, but um, I, in the performance, like I used this kind of make the leaves of this plant close with uh, my mouth uh, while uh, everybody in the audience has like this culture in their mouth. And then I made this kind of musical instrument out of like bracelets, uh, cast aluminum bracelets, which I kind of play with like a kind of one one percussion, which is like another kind of sound, which is uh, linked to like um, kind of activate, kind of, it's a bit of a tripping sound, let's say. Where did your interest in plants come from? Like, um, it seems like it's been fairly consistent through your practice that plants have been quite an important element. Um, also, you know, along with the, this sort of feminine principle or the sovereignty of the body, the female body. Um, so I'm just curious, like, you know, you've, you've referenced many different plants in your work from uh, earlier photographic works that include like San Pedro, the, the cactus, um, was, which is a considered a, like a power plant, um, has also psychoactive and spiritual um, uh, qualities as well as like more kind of commonplace plants like Japanese knotweed, which is a, a weed, you know, um, and, and many others like the, I think also mushrooms have appeared in your work. Um, this very sort of uh, specialist and um, important mushroom in Japanese culture that I think is called reishi or lingzi. Lingzi or reishi, yes. Yeah. Um, so where did this come from? Like what, what inspired you to um make work about plants uh, my family they're farmers so like uh, my my father is a geologist and uh, um but he went back to just be a farmer uh so we uh, i grew up with a lot of you know contact to plants and he's always said this like big fascination for like all these plants, not to grow them. And, uh, you know, they, they have a vineyard and this plant with all sorts of other things like 
there is not that many grapes left actually there is all sorts of like other plants and and since i live in london uh, i've been missing that and you know even like my studio like some kind of uh, greenhouse uh, you know like <laughs> Amazing. I don't have any outdoor space, but uh, um, what uh, I think the plants you're speaking about is all like, it's mainly like plants that have a uh, psychotropic kind of properties um, and uh, which were kind of the force plants that I introduced in the work. And that was, uh, it was just by taking them, you know, in uh, uh, when I was in Brazil or like in, situations in which it was possible. Uh, I, for me, it was a huge discovery. All the um, plants are kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, kind of psychedelic plants. It was a big uh, discovery of a kind of another spirituality and male intelligence, like a huge kind of, um, for me, it was uh, I've been looking for these informations for so long, and uh, it just enough, you know, <laughs> to take these ten mushrooms, and uh, you have an incredible experience. Uh, and uh, and also, I felt like uh, there was a lot of misconception about them in the sense that. Uh, I, mean, I remember the first time I took mushrooms, I thought uh, I need to give them to my parents. Half of their problems will be solved. <laughs> 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 and it's like, it's so strange that they're considered like drugs uh, and entertainment and very mm. criminalized. Well, like, I don't know anyone that could have an addiction to mushrooms. Uh, mm. And uh, takes them and you dedicate what like uh, five hours to meditate uh, on I don't know the state of your family and your relation to nature and to others oh, okay <laughs> that's really bad you know I know it's really bad it's like it's, we probably need a lot more of it in society um, and you probably I mean even I, I like this a lot but probably I have the energy and attention and thought uh, every six months, every year to do this, not, not every two days, <laughs> you know, it's not, uh, it's nothing compared to um, psychoactive substances, which, uh, you know, with, which are functional, you know, which, you know, you would drink coffee, you're more awake, you drink, mm -hmm. you took certain drugs and maybe you keep, uh, you're more entertaining or something. Well, uh, I find these plants at least engaging in a respectful way for the plants, for what they are, their tra those traditions is, uh, um, I mean, you need to dedicate a lot of energy to it, uh, a lot of focus. Mm -hmm. I think, it, I think um, that kind of uh, the, the problem that you just outlined about this kind of superstition or um, uh, yes, suspicion about the power of of these plant allies, you know, these these um, these other beings that we can commune with in different ways, and they have an effect on the way that we behave and the way that we think and feel and what what we're able to have connection with. I think it really is connected to to what I was mentioning earlier. This um, progression through history where our understanding of um, our relationship to nature essentially has really transformed uh, dramatically you know through the rise of um, scientific rationalism and materialism um, and I think you know the, this sort of connection that I mentioned between the feminine and the plant kingdom in particular um, which you know, through history then was um, misinterpreted with suspicion. So the, the wise woman of the village who was a healer, who knew how to work with different herbs, became a witch who was, you know, treated with suspicion and persecuted because it was a form of knowledge that, that actually at a certain point in history ran counter to the dominant views, which were 
materialistic. So, you know, with the, the plants that you've been and mushrooms that you've been describing, um, to sort of un try to understand them purely in materialist terms is to go against the grain of, of what they are in a way, because the, the way in which they communicate with us is not rational. It's not about, you know, purely a kind of chemical reaction on the brain. Um, it, it's about a, a communion, essentially. It's a sort of coming together of two different life forms um, on a plane or in a dimension where communication and understanding is possible and therefore um, these different realms of experience open up and there was actually a quote that I wanted to read um, to you because I thought that it was really relevant in the context of this talk today um, so it's it's a quote by Terence McKenna um, and I know that he's he's also someone that you read and have followed and um, has been important to you so this is from Food of the Gods the search for the original tree of knowledge. Um, and he said, the monstrous forces of scientific industrialism and global politics that have been born into modern times were conceived at the time of the shattering of the symbiotic relationships with the plants that had bound us to nature from our dim beginnings. This left each human being frightened, guilt burdened and alone. Existential man was born. And I think that, you know, that really um, kind of sums up this, this path that we've taken in the West, where we've really moved away from a kind of more intuitive and lived experience with nature um, and with plants in particular. And it seems to me like in your work and your paintings, there's something of that primordial relationship with plants and other, other beings, animals or the weather or, you know, the elements. Um, actually really prevails in your work and you seem to um, be making space uh, to focus on that and allow that to come forth and uh, there was one painting that I thought it would be really nice if you could talk a little bit about so it's called um, A Distant Attempt and the Present Worms this one yeah uh, so yeah I think for you this this is a painting which is kind of about I mean it's to me it's a visionary painting it's it's about you know these the the sort of externalization of something which is quite internal interior um but yeah but, well I'll leave it to you to to describe it but yeah so in this painting uh, you see the the wood as a kind of uh, pattern and that is all uh, is all little thorns that I made with like a um, Kind of sculpted all these thorns and uh, burned them, so that's what makes all this kind of pattern. And it's just the grain uh, of the wood. And then there is uh, the those animals uh, which, purposely, they're like kind of undefined. I don't know if they're cows or goats or uh, or what. And they're uh, um, painted with um, iron oxide. Uh, kind of red, reddish brown pigment and for me they're um, kind of a reference to cave paintings um, and um, uh, you know like it seems that uh, among kind of the most accredited contemporary theories on cave paintings uh, um, they are believed to be made by people in altered state of consciousness uh, um, so like Velasco paintings and so on, uh, possibly because of uh, being in a cave uh, in the dark uh, or, or also for the ingestion of uh, different psychoactive plants. Uh, but um, so like the distant attempt for me is this kind of, uh, you know, the beginning of representation, the beginning of paintings and so And uh, also, you know, they thought uh, that because what originally was thought to be hunting scenes, uh, um, often the animals did not correspond to the animals that were in the location. So like maybe in the north of France, uh, that many millions of years ago, there was not, <laughs> there were not those animals. <laughs> or, um, and also that it was often people uh, shifting from animal shape to uh, human shape. Uh, like te teriantropy, 
uh, and that's also linked to rituals. This is why, you know, archaeologists nowadays think that possibly those were representations of uh, more representation of trips or rituals than representations of hunting scenes. Mm -hmm. And um, and then in the image there is uh, these two figures uh, and. Uh, there, uh, one has like kind of board, board uh, um, feet, and uh, it's kind of waving to the animals, kind of like tell me or something. And one is looking, but then actually they go their way. And then there is a uh, this um, porcupine needles. There is like a rain of porcupine needles, which are actual porcupine needles. It kind of falls on them, and they beat like uh, some kind of danger. Uh, while uh, kind of to the animals and them being like, uh, for me, it's just sort of like sometimes, you know, this empathy, it doesn't translate so easily, <laughs> you know, uh, what we feel would be good uh, for, uh, I don't know, it's like, um, I, I like to represent humans in a bit of a humble situation. Um, in the sense that uh, even uh, the ecological kind of statements, like uh, we need to save the planets, what will happen if there is no more plants? What, I mean, I find them really, I mean, I'm completely for ecology, but uh, I find them very pretentious in the sense that uh, plants have been around for a lot more time than us. Eh? Uh, they will be around uh, after we all, after human disappear. So it's not like humans have the power to save the plant. Like we have the power to behave in a way that may save ourselves or buy us a little bit more time on this planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think we have a power to, uh, you know, it's like, it's almost like, I, I wish the ecological discourse would be almost a little bit more selfish so that a lot more people could join it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is the idea we will destroy the plant and still be around. It's not really realistic. We will not be around. Yeah. <laughs> like it's enough a few temperature increase or is enough a few species disappearing and we're not going to be around. Um, and that will be totally fine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, they'll be totally fine without us for a party. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the way you were talking about that painting, it, it really speaks to a lot of kind of animistic ideas about the, you know, a way of conceiving of the world and our place in it, where everything is imbued with spirit, actually, and we're not, you know, there isn't really a hierarchy, it's that we're different forms of this great spirit, essentially. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the, the way that humanity has progressed in the West is that we lost touch with those kind of forms of spiritual worship or that, that form of understanding the world and moved into this very hubristic way of existing and operating, which um, play, as you say, like places mankind, you know, humanity at the top of the ladder somehow, like presiding over the rest of the natural world. Um, and it's from that that so many of our problems have arisen, you know, and I think this kind of need to um, go back to, uh, you know, like the idea of worshipping a plant, for example, as people in the, the Amazon do, indigenous peoples, um, you know, really place plants right at the center of their cosmology, to me is not, um, not sort of incredulous or misguided at all. I think it's so relevant for the time that we're in, especially that um, we would look at something which is perceived to be quite humble, the, you know, vegetal life is sort of the bottom of the rung of the ladder um, in the West, but actually it has so much to, to teach us about how to be and how to exist. Like you say, it was, the vegetal kingdom was here long before us, and uh, there's no doubt that it would continue after we annihilate ourselves with the behaviours that we're, we've seem to be so wedded to in spite of their um the damage that they're doing so yeah i think it's i think that's something that does come through in your work is this kind of pantheistic or um sort of animist conception of the world 
Um, and I, I was just wondering, as you've been talking about that painting, whether you could talk about the other painting behind you, which I think is called Plants Love Him or Plants Like Him. Um, there is a man hanging from a branch with, uh, he's using a like prancer feet, like monkeys. And uh, which is like, I actually, represented this thing in a lot of um, in a lot of uh, paintings uh, it, uh, it started when I had my first son uh, because the children have that uh, they still do that uh, and uh, they have a reflex of like grabbing things with the toes uh, but then uh, you know through wearing shoes and uh, standing up and so on we lose it even if we still have a tiny bit of it and um, I kind of like to remember all we think, you know, when we think about evolution, uh, there is, it's just like a path. It's like we, we're taking one path, we could have taken another one, and it's not necessarily we took the best one. Uh, mm -hmm. the other parts. And uh, we still have uh, a little bit of these other possibilities. And he's kind of serene, but just not the protagonist. I mean, he's there. And then, uh, it's all the plants that are like kind of touching him and like stroking a little bit, uh, kind of gently, but uh, uh, you know, the orchid seems to be kissing his hand and uh, um, yes, the other leaves are like going in his direction. Um, and uh, I think this is the first time I have like a male figure in my work. <laughs> This may be like three paintings with like male figures in uh, all with, know, 20 years I've been making paintings. And they're always kind of handled, like <laughs> always like these other like elements. Um, so it's quite intuitive representation. And uh, it's just, in it's intriguing to me that he's there, you know, with these other plants that are kind of like his friends. And I think, have you made a, I, I think I've seen an earlier painting that's similar, like from 2015 or something. Is it part of a series? Tiny. Yeah. The tiny one. Eh? Uh-huh. Uh, and I just wanted to see it uh, kind of more like my, my sights. <laughs> <laughs> it's different colors as well and techniques. But uh, actually this image has been like, hunting me a little bit recently. So I did make another one, which is uh, this one. I don't know if you can see. Oh, wow. Which, I mean, they've started to look more and more like a, a friend. Um, this is a kind of, there is a lot of uh, mosquitoes and clouds and wind. It's like, in this case, it's more like a, way there and the temperature dealing with what's happening to him. Mm. A friend made me notice that actually this painting start to look more and more like the um, hanging man in the tarot, which is something I know nothing about, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe in synchronicities. So. <laughs> Yeah, it, it oh, definitely no. does. I think um, they found me. I don't know. I don't. I haven't found them because I, I. Well, it's a kind of archetypal image, the Hanging Man. So um, maybe it's come from your unconscious to, maybe say something. Whatever that might be. And they showed me was a house. Uh, one of the things that uh, I tried to represent there were plants uh, that were linked to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. like psychotropic plants linked to Mediterranean because when uh, I started uh, being interested in psychedelics and so I, I really was a bit I had a bit of frustration with why is all exotic plants and uh, why is all this like rituals from very far away very, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, doing a little bit of research you find out no actually there are plants that grow even in Europe and so on, but just the use of them uh, and, and the knowledge of them uh, has been lo lost. Uh, mm -hmm. 
and um, and for a plant uh, in in the show in particular there was uh, this um, drawing this carving with the uh, datura stramonio which mm -hmm. Italy grows quite commonly like in uh, I was in in Sicily there, there were several plants easily found but uh, with that specific plant uh, <coughs> it's not difficult to find but uh, the dosage like the concentration of the active ingredients changes so much from plant to plant and from how that plant has been exposed to the weather, the air, to the soil, the age of the plant and so on, that is very difficult to dose it. But so it speaks about, you know, a kind of life in which people would have known that specific plant, they would have known what had happened that season to the weather in relation to that plant and so they could know how much to take of it mm -hmm. nowadays people take it and maybe they get poisoned because they don't know you know unless you do some <laughs> proper like lab tests it would be quite difficult to to dose it from what i understood i never used it but uh, yeah that's i mean that's amazing i just as you were talking i was thinking back to the start of the talk you were talking about your family um having a vineyard and I mean the closest thing in my mind to that sort of really in intimate knowledge um, is you know the making of wine so the particular soil that 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 vine has been planted in whether it's you know what incline the the land is on whether it's facing the sun or not and then you know the the different vintages that are that are made each year based on the weather and you know the amount of rainfall it's it combines so many different things which are not just about the plant but about you know the the kind of environment and the weather and you know it sort of speaks to um the principles of permaculture of sort of being in tune with what's happening in the celestial realm so planting certain things um under the moon or you know in a particular constellation um, again, you know, goes back to this, the way that, that people understood the natural world in the medieval era and, and much earlier that we've kind of lost because we just think in terms of, um, you know, like predictable science and um, the, these much more kind of cold ways of, of interacting. So, yeah, that's a really lovely story and maybe a nice place to end.